الصراع الدائر في الشرق الأوسط من يديره من خلف الستار وما هي مساراته المتعددة وهل هناك خشية متزايدة من تحول الربيع العربي إلى ثورة ثقافية ناشئة وما يعني ذلك وهل يمكن أن تختزل الثورات العربية بمسميات ومشاريع فئوية ضيقة من داخل منتدى النزاعات والعقل الاستخباري والدبلوماسي البريطاني معكم زينب الصفار تابعونا هو أليستر كروك مؤسس ومدير منتدى النزاعات في بيروت والمسؤول السابق في الاستخبارات البريطانية MI6 عمل مستشارا خاصا لشؤون الشرق الأوسط لدى المسؤول السابق للسياسة الخارجية في الاتحاد الأوروبي خافير سولانا كان أحد الأعضاء البارزين في لجنة ميتشل المتقصية أسباب اندلاع الانتفاضة الفلسطينية عام 2000-2001 ومستشارا للرباعية الدولية سهل العديد من عمليات وقف إطلاق النار في فلسطين المحتلة وكذلك سهل انسحابات للقوات المحتلة في مناسبتين السر الذي يتمتع بخبرة عشرين عاما من العمل مع الحركات الإسلامية في أفغانستان وباكستان والشرق الأوسط ماذا يخبرنا عن تقاطع مصالح الغرب وتنظيم القاعدة في أواخر الثمانينيات من القرن الماضي ضد الاتحاد السوفيتي في أفغانستان وهل ما تشهده المنطقة من احتياج تكفيري وتطهير فئوي وخاصة في سوريا وجوارها سيدفع الولايات المتحدة وحلفائها إلى ركوب نمر القاعدة وما ستكون تبعات ذلك هل أضحى حلفاء الأمس في أفغانستان أعداء الحاضر في العالم وسائل اليوم في الشرق الأوسط للقضاء على ما سمي محور الشر Alistair Crook, uh, founder and director of Conflicts Forum, welcome to the inside. Uh, to start, sir, uh, how do you read uh, regarding your 30 year of expertise in the region? Let's say, how do you read what is happening currently at the present time here in the region? Well, I think what is happening in many ways is as dramatic and it will have as long reaching consequences as what I did see 25 years ago. 25, 30 years ago, I was on the borders with Afghanistan during that time when we first saw, if you like, the firing up of radical Sunnism. That time to try and defeat Russia, mm -hmm. to fight the Soviet Union and the occupation of Afghanistan. What were and you doing there? I was there to report on what was happening in the war, and I was the link to all of the Mujahideen political leaders uh, and the resistance leaders at that time. And all of Islam was there. It was a very fascinating time. Well, what do you mean by all Islam was there? All the spectrum was there, from Osama bin Laden, from Azam, Abdul Azam, right through to Ayatollahs from Qom in exile that I used to go and see. So there was a huge spectrum. Um, and there was, of course, not in Peshawar or in the borders, um, but there was also uh, other groups that were in the north, uh, the famous Panshia groups. Uh, Mm -hmm. those groups uh, as well. So all of the different elements of what is now political Islam were present uh, at, at that time. Yes, but, but, but there were certain reports, and excuse me here to refer to them, but uh, it has been said that you were there as an MI6 agent trying to funnel weapons and arms to the Mujahideen uh, to take on the Soviet. How far is that true? Well, you know, these are things that newspapers say, mm -hmm. and you know, I can't say more than that. But what I what I can say is that I think this is precisely the what we are seeing today, a repetition of this, uh, a repetition, and therefore that I see very clearly uh, of Western states, particularly America, but Britain too, uh, not funneling weapons directly, but facilitating weapons, mm -hmm. putting them. Morally, there's very little difference. They may say, well, we're not actually doing the weapons. But it's rather the same moral question uh, as when the West says, well, no, we don't torture people. We just send them to Egypt or Jordan to be tortured to be there, tortured and, there and then we get the reports from mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. 
It's the same moral standard, if you like, of well, doing this. Sir, but well, yeah, we will talk about this US-UK yeah. track that is being uh, now active and gaining more momentum, mm. let's say, here in the region. But uh, according to the Saudi-owned uh, Al Hayat Daily, it stated that the climate in the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, indicates that matters are heading towards a GCC Iranian-Russian confrontation on Syrian soil, uh, which is similar to what took place in Afghanistan back in the late 1980s, about this period where uh, you were then. And also a recent Israeli perspective on developments vis-a-vis -vis Syria from the Israeli Dabka intelligence website uh, on the 31st of August. It says thousands of Sunni jihadists rally on three continents on Assad, like the 1980s conscription of volunteers to drive the Russian army of Afghanistan. So uh, well, how can you draw the parallels between what happened back in the late 1980s and what is taking place now? I think one can make a very clear parallel and that's why I say that what is happening now is so serious because out of that period 25 years ago we had nearly two decades of war of terror, the invasion of Iraq and the continuing civil war in Afghanistan and bombs in European cities too. So there's profound consequences. When I was there 25 years ago, remember that the northern parts of Pakistan, uh, Deir, Swat, right across to northern India, even parts of Kandahar, were still essentially Sufi at that period. Then, now, it's a, if you like, a Salafist hegemon. Dar al Olum University, the graduates coming out, the changes in the, in, in the courses, a cultural revolution that has swept, if you like, uh, that part of the world, the eastern lands of Islam. Now, I believe we're seeing it is the turn of the western lands of Islam, of Syria, of greater Syria, of Lebanon, Palestine, North Africa, down to the middle of Africa, to experience a cultural revolution, which is the Salafization of the western lands of uh, Islam. And the Salafization of it is both cultural, but it is also becoming profoundly political. Of course its roots go back some way in the past. We've known that Saudis have done this. But what has really ignited this and turned this into something so dangerous really are two things. That after the 2006 war here in Lebanon, in which Israel was defeated by Hezbollah, uh, the Saudi government and the Saudi king and the Gulf states embarked on a language, a discourse of clear sectarianism. Why? Because they had... Uh, Why couldn't they digest, you know, a resistance group in Lebanon defeating Israel? Because, they because were Israel is the enemy we're supposed to know. Of course, but they were frightened that this was going to see a rise in the influence of Iran and a rise in the influence of Hezbollah. And the Americans gave a green light in 2007 and said, no, anything that circumscribes the influence of Iran, that limits it, that's a good thing. So go ahead and did it. So we had this sort of language coming out, language that talked of, if you like, one third of the Syrian people should die in order to free the two thirds uh, of the Syrians. This very sharp sectarian language which has been characteristic of this period, not just in Syria, but throughout the region, and particularly also in other states that are adjacent to, to, to Syria, we have seen the same thing. But this language, plus the other aspect, the aspect of the beginning of the language of the Khalifa, the beginning of the language of the Ummah, the combination of the proposals, the endorsement, seeing the Arab awakening, if you like, as the beginning of the fourth Khalifa. Caliphate, and yes. Caliphate. And seeing at the same time this language of sectarian has really empowered the extreme end of the Sunni spectrum. It's in its, on its own terms, the sectarian language empowers the takfiri jihadists mm -hmm. because no one can trump the takfiri jihadists in their sectarianism. And what it has also done is not only empower them and legitimize the extreme end of the spectrum, but it is actually removed, it has made completely silent the moderates of Sunni Islam because they're too frightened. They're frightened that they'll be called apostates or that they will be called supporters of Assad mm -hmm. or traitors, mm -hmm. that therefore we have seen the silencing of the voice of moderate Islam. At the same time we have seen, if you like, the empowering of the voice of the takfiri jihadists. 
And we're seeing that very clearly, not only in Syria, where it is most manifest, but this is something that is taking place really across the Western lands. Mm -hmm. And it serves, of course, Gulf interests. Uh, Alistair, who's pushing the recruiting uh, machines button, let's say? It's quite clear, and it's made clear, you just quoted an, an article, and it's clear that the recruiting is done by the services of Doha uh, and by the services of Riyadh. And its purpose is well, quite clear. What about clear. the CIA? What about the MIT, the Turkish As intelligence? Said, the, what the, about the MI6? Of course they're involved, mm -hmm. but they're not perhaps involved directly in handing over weapons here and there. They simply funnel people. Masterminding, perhaps. They're masterminding, funneling the weapons, mm -hmm. and also, quite likely, providing advice on the ground, tactical advice, and giving them intelligence and support, uh, maps and form, and also perhaps even intercept material. But there uh, has the been others. reports also in the Turkish media. It's saying that there is a kind of debacle when it comes to the Syrian issue. Turkey is in a debacle when it comes to uh, uh, the Syrian issue because, you know, uh, the Syrians or the, the opposition, the Syrian opposition have been using the refugee camps as training camps uh, and uh, have been doing certain actions which is also not in favor of the Turkish public. They could not stomach it. Uh, precisely. And again, this is a repetition, exact repetition of what we saw 25 years ago. Then Pakistan, Zia al-Haq, President Zia al-Haq, thought that he was able to control Salafism and use them in Afghanistan in order to preserve Pakistan's interests in Afghanistan, and contributed and uh, was the author of the Islamization, if you like, uh, of um, the forces fighting if you like, in Afghanistan. What is the result? Now that Pakistan is again also finding that these movements turn back on the society that spawns them and undermines and attacks these societies. Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia and Doha are playing a very dangerous game. It turned and it bit the Pakistanis and it may turn and bit all those that are sponsoring them. For 25 years, just want to say for 25 years, I've seen people think that they can use and manipulate the Salafists because these are sincere, pious people who don't understand politics. Right. In the end, what I have seen is the opposite, that it's the Salafists who've ended up by manipulating those who thought they were manipulating the Salafists. Right, Alistair, we're going to focus more on this cultural clash or religious clash, mm. but we have to stop now for a short break. A short break and we'll be back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to The Inside. Welcome back, Alistair. Thank you. Well, you talked in one of your articles about the awakening, which is taking a turn. It's very different to how it was hailed at the outset, and it's becoming increasingly feared and understood as a nascent cultural revolution. How can you explain this, especially in the wake of what the GCC countries, like Qatar, like Saudi Arabia, like other GCC countries, are doing now in the Middle East, particularly in Syria? I think it's very clear that at the bottom what is being attempted is to re-establish a Sunni hegemony, a Sunni, a specifically Sunni hegemony across the entire western lands of, of Islam and across North Africa, even down to Nigeria and, and Mali. And the Sunni hegemony is seen first of all as a right of Saudi Arabia, as a right because these were seen to be primarily Sunni lands. What about and Egypt? And Egypt, of course, as yes. North Africa. Mm. Sorry, I meant it in those terms. Yes. But, and of course in Egypt. And, and the aim of this, the aim purposely, is of course, first of all, to implant the idea, the tradition of Salafism. Television channels, social welfare programs, whatever it is. Because Salafism accepts not, if you like, democratic authority, but accepts a completely different authority. It accepts the authority of the Rashidun the first, if you like, uh, Muslim communities. And this, of course, is perfect for the Saudi and Gulf states because it eviscerates the whole sense of the uh, re reformist Islamism, the reformist Islamism of a, of a Hamas, of a Muslim Brotherhood, 
the other groups and replaces it with authority. And of course the Saudi king claims to be the leader or the representative of that authority today. So what we are seeing is, if you like, the restoration of, of if you like, a Sunni Muslim hegemony in Westland, seen primarily in order to contain and circumscribe the power of Iran. Again, it always comes back to Iran, mm -hmm. as it did in 2007, as it does in Syria now, is basically in the end about circumscribing the power and trying to undermine Iran. But, and this is clear in the fact that even the Israelis in their media outlets and in their statements, ranging from the Israeli President Shimon Peres and other uh, prime figures uh, in the Israeli cabinet, they are shunning away the prospect of a military, Israeli military strike against uh, Iran. Maybe they are shifting this role into uh, other countries to do it, in a sense of trying to topple the Syrian regime and try to isolate Iran and deal a blow to it. I think from the beginning, the Western agenda, the agenda of the United States, has been to strike a strategic blow at Iran through, if you like, overthrowing the government in, in, Syria. in Syria. And this has been very clear. I'm not sure whether we are going to see uh, any Israeli strike, direct strike, on Iran in this period leading up to the American elections or immediately afterwards, uh, it's clearly very divisive within Israel, for one thing. It's clear that in and the government there's support, but there is almost no support uh, amongst the intelligence and security leaders Because in Israel, some of them it. refer to the fact that with Ehud Barak and uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, they don't think that those two people can lead Israel at a time of a strike against Iran. That's they are true. not so sure. They don't believe that at all. And they're very skeptical and very doubtful of their claims that this will be a simple operation, a simple military action. There will be very few casualties. And, it, and also the, 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 the assumption on which it's rested is that Iran dare not respond fully. It dare not respond fully because it knows, Iran knows that if it responds fully, America will come into the war and that will be devastating. Mm -hmm. I think this is a complete misunderstanding of the Iranian position because the Iran looks and sees the region through the experience of Iraq. And as you know, Iraq didn't respond. It was pushed and it was pushed with sanctions and military action and never responded. And what happened? It was still destroyed at the end of the process. Mm -hmm. So they will respond, I believe, if they are attacked. And we do not know if they will be. We do not know what the consequences of that will be but it will certainly be profound. It is a real, if you like, ticking bomb Let in the region. Let me talk here about the consequences of this conflict by its own logic, uh, if it turns into a kind of clash of religious poles. No, I hope that this will not happen, uh, but clearly that potential is there. Uh, we're talking now about fitna rather than about really... A sectarian uh, strife, a sectarian yes. strife rather than we're talking about a political, if you like, uh, um, a competition. But the seeds of competition between the elements, between, if you like, the Akhwan, the Muslim Brotherhood, if you like, the Salafist orientation of the Saudis and the Mojo Takfiri Jihadist orientation, also closely linked with the Saudis, all of those groups are in competition with one another. And it may be that what we are going to see, and what we're seeing to a certain extent already, is, is Sunni on Sunni clashes. But of course, at any moment, that could turn into uh, a sunni shi clash. And people are trying to create that. There's no doubt that they try and create it. And of course, always there has been behind this the uh, Israeli from the time of Ben-Gurion and the American policy uh, that where Muslims fight each other, Israel is a safer prospect, that view. Uh, Alistair Howe has uh, this uh, shift towards reimagining of a um, wider Muslim polity uh, ha hold implications on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? It, I believe it does have real, if you like, implications. And I, I intend to use language a little bit loosely here, so your mm -hmm. viewers will have to forgive me. Yes. But if you like, what we have seen in Israel during this period is, of course, Israel has its ummah. It has a concept of a state where any Jew anywhere in the world can step into Israel, and as he steps in, he has the right 
to, uh, to right to live there, right to land, houses, and everything else. Um, and increasingly, um, increasingly, we have also seen Israel turning itself into a khalifa, mm -hmm. into a state which is primarily for the Jewish people. For the Jewish people, a Jewish nation state, as they keep emphasizing, Palestinian recognized. Well, as we see the same trends now happening in the Muslim world, the move towards the Ummah, towards a Khalifa, I believe we will start to see the clash taking place uh, between these two uh, currents of thought that are prominent now. So that the clash will increasingly be, if you like, between uh, Al-Aqsa and the Temple Mount, symbolized by these two clear religious symbols, and much less, if you like, the the clash that was defined as it has been defined since Oslo is a really sectarian clash, a sectarian clash, a sec sorry, I mean a secular clash, a clash, mm -hmm. if you like, between the nation state, the creation of the nation state, which is based really on Western thinking. Mm -hmm. I think it will acquire a much more religious overtones um, in that, and that we will have, if you like, uh, Israeli Salafists taking the lead on, on that side, as well as Muslim Salafists uh, voicing their concern about the Palestinians. Do we have Israeli Salafists, or you mean Absolutely. like Zionists, more Zionist extreme Israelis? I'm, I'm talking about, I'm losing language very, very loosely. But what we're seeing is a real manifestation of the hard right mm -hmm. in, in Israel. In, in also in mainstream parties, just recently, um, uh, the head of Shas parties, said it was time that Iran should be erased, should be destroyed. The Iranians were dangerous. Allow so we're seeing this also in, 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 in some of the mainstream parties. Allow me to ask you one last question. According to Ed Hussein, a senior fellow for Middle Eastern Studies at the U.S. Council on Foreign Relations, in the National Review on August 23rd, he said, why Al-Qaeda is winning? And unnoticed by the West, Al-Qaeda is seizing a golden opportunity and uh, manifesting its stronghold or its foot uh, steps and foothold in Syria. Now, Al-Qaeda and the West interest, uh, they came together back in the late 1980s in Afghanistan. Is the U.S. going to ride the, and its allies, let's say, the Al-Qaeda tiger again? And what would be the consequences? Look, this is exactly what I've been trying to bring out about Afghanistan, what Ed Hussein was surprising correspondent for this, but is saying exactly what I was saying. All those years ago, 25 years ago, we all looked aside. We didn't want to look at what was happening, what was changing, what was actually taking place, because it was so good then, it was so popular, if you like, to be delivering the blow uh, to the Soviet Union, yes. uh, to damaging the Soviet Union, that we all looked aside and assumed this was fine. And this is precisely what's happening now. The mm -hmm. West, in its hurry, in its if you like, frenzy to strike a blow, first at Gaddafi and now at President Assad, is looking aside, not looking at who is actually commanding the forces on the ground and finding this huge influx that we've seen of takfiri jihadists. So perhaps they would be locked in again with They will not only be locked extreme. in with again, but recall that the consequences the last right. time were bombs in Europe, New York, and elsewhere, as well as in this region. Former Special Middle East Advisor to European Union's Foreign Policy Chief, Javier Solana, founder and director of Conflicts Forum, Mr. Alistair Crook, many thanks indeed for joining us. Thank you for having me on your program. Yes. إذن لقاء جديد وضيف جديد من كل الميادين ودائما من الداخل بريدنا the inside at الميادين.net إذن the inside at الميادين.net من كل فريق العمل من كل الميادين إلى اللقاء